So I've actually been uh, using the Godot engine for something like uh, four years and I created like lots of things here. I've also created this YouTube channel with over 10,000 subscribers. Um, so indeed the experience that having the engine is quite wide and throughout my journey I've been able to learn lots of super interesting things in the engine that will be able to streamline your workflow, to create things easier, to create better uh, code, better games, etc. That I wish I had been told when I started, okay? So well, I will show you all that uh, in this video by basically using this practical example, this practical game uh, that I created in which I've applied all the things that I will uh, tell you. And the first thing that I want to tell you is to learn how to use signals uh, as soon as possible because they are super helpful. Uh, for example, in this uh, particular game, I have my main scene and what happens is that I have here a timer, a progression timer and uh, what is happening is that basically, well, I have a progression amount and this basically speeds up uh, things, okay, the, the vehicles, the player, etc. But I basically have too many things that have to react to this because I'm changing the speed. So I have to change the vehicle's speed, the background speed, the player speed. Uh, so this is way of handling this is with basically a signal that I, that I named progress made. The cool thing about this is that, for example, now this signal will appear over here and I can connect it to anything with with every, with every any th single script that I want over here. So, for example, I connected it to the background itself. And when there is a progress that has been made, I am basically just updating the auto scroll speed as simple as that. And this allows you to write a clean and decoupable code because, of course, here in the main scene, I could have, for example, no. Uh, get the, um, the background node and access there, the progress, sorry, the auto scroll when the progress was made. But well, it is not a good practice here from the main script in this case to access that node modified over there. It is much cleaner, much more expandable if you just have a signal, then you listen to it over here and you do what you need in this specific script because it also makes your code much cleaner. Because also, not only did I use it over there, but also, for example, when I spawn a vehicle, I also connect this signal to the vehicle instance. So, I and by the way, I also do it um, over here, yes, on, on the vehicle itself. And once again over here, I handle here the update of the speed, okay? So as you can see how everything is being kept nice, decapable, efficient, clean, etc. So start learning how to use them right now. Now also something that you probably have seen is uh, these already variables. This is the best way of catching a reference uh, to any kind of node because it is um, quite uh, performant, easy to reference, etc. Um, but well, instead of, for example, if I wanted to reference the coins container to how to type it uh, over here, the best way that you can do is basically um, grab it over here with your left mouse click, hold down now control and release your left mouse click over here, okay? And the, re the reference will automatically be created. Uh, basically here I'm receiving an error because I have already uh, had a reference over there created. As well, super useful for when you want to quickly reference your notes. Then I'm sure that in lots of games you're basically clamping your uh, player position to avoid it from escaping or exiting the screen. So for example here the player cannot pass through this and cannot pass through this, the, the other edge of the screen, okay? There are multiple ways of doing this with lots of if, uh, with lots of different clamp position statements or some stuff like that. But this is way is to just go to your physics process or process function depending on a, if you're moving a physics body or a character body or just an area and just over here you can call this position equals position dot clamp you provide a, the minimum okay in most cases it will be vector 2.0 and then the screen size and to get the screen size you just create an already variable okay of type vector 2 uh, and you basically get the viewport rect dot size so it, this will basically mean to clamp the player from 0, 0 that is over here to the screen size that will be over here. So basically the player can only walk in places um, inside of the screen. You can of course toggle this logic as needed, but as you can see in just one line of code, you are able to do this. Another thing that I do a lot is to use the pick random methods in arrays. So for example, if we take a look at the vehicles, I have an array here with the different vehicles. And I have to select a random a texture for my sprite. So instead of having to use a for loop for I in range a loop or something like that, 
I can just uh, create here a variable to store the random texture and assign here vehicles.pickRandom, which exactly will do that, will pick a, a random element from the array. So once again, it is super clean, straightforward and efficient. I do it uh, over here in the vehicle and also I have it over here on the uh, decorations script where as you can see I have the exact same thing, random texture and I have decorations.pickRandom and then I, and I assign this random texture to the sprite texture because over here where I have is a decorations scene with once again an array with different decorations that the game can use. The next thing comes to ordering all these nodes together. Probably you have seen people a lot using the, um, the Z index over here and it is not bad okay, for a beginner for a simple game when you just want to sort one or two things but take, take into account this game that is, let's say, bigger than just a, a super small product that you have to sort the decorations, the background, the road on top of that, the coin, the vehicles, lots of things. So the Z index, it is not pretty expandable since, I don't know, okay, yes, the vehicle is in Z index 3 and then on top of this in Z index 4, I want to have the coin, but it's not something that you can visually do. And also then if you want to go back and change this order, it's going to be a disaster. You will spend endless time on that. So on the other hand, a pretty handy way of doing this is um, in your main scene, okay, try to have everything inside of containers uh, and also follow the draw order that Godot does. Godot will draw things from top to bottom. So firstly, in this case, it is drawing the background, on top the road, on top the trail of the player, on top of it the player, on top of it the vehicles, etc. So for example, I know if I put the player over here behind the background, I am not going to be able to see it, okay? And by the way, I'm, I am keeping all the obstacle, all the objects Z index in zero, okay? And I'm just ordering here them manually. And then for objects that I am instantiating or spawning at runtime, I basically have these containers, okay? Um, and I just spawn them over here. So I want my vehicles on top of my player. I want my decorations on top of my vehicles, my coins on top of this, etc. So well, that is how basically you're going to be able to order stuff without the Z index. And it is super expandable because then if I say, okay, no, I want my decorations to be uh, behind the vehicles. Well, I just do this and that's all that I have to do, for example. Then I want to quickly uh, go over this because I already have created videos about it. But it's basically to use auto load. If you actually take a look at the game, I have like, let's say, I think two or three auto loads. I have this global script that basically has some data, basically this speed that then you're going to be able to, uh, to access this variable uh, globally and quickly be able to reference it, decrease it, uh, or whatever you really want to do to this variable. So for example, I am accessing here in the main, uh, then this value is also used uh, for the coins in order to move them. It is also uh, used then in the player to also uh, move the player. Uh, let me check it over here. Um, it is necessarily used everywhere, so that's why here this global uh, auto load is super important and super helpful also for auto loading your music and avoiding it from being cut in different scene changes. This is just a scene that has an audio stream player and the audio itself. Here you are not listening to the music because I disabled it for this video. And I also have just a UI audio being auto loaded so that I can quickly play this UI audio in both the main scene and the menu. Uh, so once again, that is a deeper topic that you are going to that I have already showed in in other videos here. But well, start learning to use auto loads efficiently um, because you can just go to project settings, um, globals, auto loads, and here well you can directly go there and auto load your stuff. So it's super simple to use and super efficient. The next thing, quite easy and straightforward. It's basically use static typing, okay? Uh, once again, it is a bigger topic. There are lots of advantages, but basically it makes your code cleaner, more performant. It also, uh, Godot will be able to tell you uh, errors, about errors before you're running the code, because I don't know if I wanted to uh, assign here score to be hello, which is a string, okay? It is going to tell me, okay, no, but a score is an integer. This is a string, this is not valid. This is a pretty simple example and actually quite absurd, but there are other cases in which it's even useful to have directly the type over here. So yes, make sure that you learn how to use this because it is something that you will always be taking advantage of in the longer run. Also, or in order to make your code even cleaner, you can differentiate between private and public. So basically, anything that is public, basically a variable or a function, is prefixed with an underscore. So this score, coins and level variables are only accessed in this main script. 
But then if I access this main script in other script and I modify this level, this that would uh, be, make this variable be public, okay? And therefore I should call it like this. And the exact same thing applies for functions, okay? As you can see in this case, I have all of them with an underscore because they are private functions that I'm only calling on this script. But for example, in my global script, this speed variable is not prefixed with an underscore because I am of course accessing it in other places. The same thing with these uh, functions in the fade script because I am uh, calling these functions outside of here. And by the way, talking about this, there's also an official JDScript style guide that you can quickly look for. And here there is something that is the code order. Okay, and as you can see, depending on if things are public or private, their order changes in the script. You should always try to use this order in your own scripts. These are not hard rules to follow, but they are quite useful for uh, having like an actual structure to use in, in your different scripts. So I really recommend you do this. So basically, for example, um, in this case, I only have uh, private variables in my main script, but if I had publics, as you can see, public comes before private. So if I had here, uh, I know, another uh, public variable, I would call it exactly like this and not with an underscore, okay? And I leave an empty line in behind. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about game juice, about game feel. So, so basically, everything, mm -hmm. every single interaction in your game should have some kind of effect, okay? It could have a trail, it could have a particle, it could have even more stuff, but everything should be animated. When you play this game, you have a, a fade in, and you also, then when you uh, press play, okay, there you have the animation, then you have the fade. So as you can see, mostly every single interaction in the game uh, has some effect behind. The player has the trail, the coin has the animation, so you really have to start paying attention to those details in game because this game without these elements would be literally quite uh, difficult for a player to play it for some time because it's not going to feel satisfying. And also talking about game juice, uh, something that you can uh, use a lot is to change the easing, okay? So for example, I have this collect coin animation that does exactly that. But as you can see, it doesn't look too linear, the movement. It does look quite smooth, quite interesting. Uh, so it, basically what I do is to select all my uh, animations. And I basically right click over here is in and out, okay? And here I'm going to be having a pretty different effect, okay? From what I used to have linear, okay? Sorry, there it was completely linear. So it looked like a little bit maybe... Um, not, not too satisfying, but if I use easing out, for example, it, it does look quite satisfying. And, and you also have some some other uh, that you can choose, but I believe that the best one is easing out. Or I actually um, didn't use this because I thought that it didn't look quite cool at the moment that I created the game, so that's why I kept it in linear. But this type of animation or, or easing is actually quite useful for UI elements. Um, so let me actually show here in the menu that I believe that here I use that easing settings over here. Yes, you just select them, right click, and there you have it. Okay. And the last thing that I want to mention is uh, how to use animation tracks. So basically, for example, here, instead of disabling the collision through code, what I did is, is I added a track. It was a property track over here of the collision shape. And I just put here the disabler. Okay property and I disable it over here um, and then for example at the end of the animation I'm calling the queue free on the area once again in this case it was called method track inside of the area 2d okay and here I have added this so insert key and I just call here the queue free okay so let me put it over here so well of course you can still do this uh, via code okay uh, but well this does allow you to save some time and to also just make sure that everything is timed perfectly so it's another way of getting things done. If you are serious about leveling up your Godot skills, check out my course. In less than 6 hours, you'll master Godot fundamentals while building this amazing project. Links in the description. See you there.